thank you for joining this session uh, with Dana. Uh, you know, I, I think I first met you, Dana, in uh, New York City when uh, when we were both uh, at a conference. Uh, it's been many years now; I don't remember. So uh, it, it's it's an honor to basically have you join us uh, and present at this conference. You're also doing a workshop uh, after the conference. So thank you very much for uh, being part of this conference. Uh, over to you, Dana. All right, thank you so much. Well, I'm super excited to be here today. Um, as uh, Nourish said, um, it's been uh, many years that we've known each other. I always um, had a dream to speak at the um, Agile um, India conference. So while I'm here virtually, it's still a pleasure to be here. And I'm excited to um, share a couple of ideas with you. Starting with the session that I have today that's called Journey Without Fear, Leading Your Teams to High and I'm going to start sharing. All right, so now you should be able to see my slides. And in order to participate in this session, because we will try to make it a little bit more interactive than just lecture, so you will need a couple of things. You will need um, your phone or um, access to browser, which is <laughs> something that you already have since you're watching. And if you have a pen, pen and paper somewhere close to you, that would be wonderful because we're going to run a small exercise with you that you will take back to your teams and try it with them. And with Can that- just, uh, Please turn on your camera, sorry. Oh yes, of course. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> All right. And with that, we're going to go to our first um, exercise. And this is where you will need to access your phone. Yes. So you will need to go to uh, www.menti.com and enter the code 782117. Or you can just point your phone at the QR code and scan it. It will take you to the same place. And once you're there, you should be able to see the first question. And our first question is, where are you doing this from? So just go ahead and respond to the question. And I'll give you a few seconds for people to join. So again, it's www.menti.com and the code is 782117. Yeah, and India is a big country, so come on, give me you know, some places where you're coming from. Where are you joining from? All right. Very cool. Looks like Bangalore is getting. And some people are already beginning to answer the second question, so <laughs> wait for it. First, we'll just I'm gonna give a few more seconds for people to enter where they're from. And it's raining here. It's raining here too in New York City. So I guess we have something in common. Very cool. All right. So we're going to move to the second question, which is going to be related to the topic that I'm going to be sharing here today. Because today's session is about uh, psychological fear and things that prevent us, oh, sorry, psychological safety <laughs> and the fear in the workplace that you know, may prevent us from um, you know, getting to the uh, psychological safety um, in the teams. So with that, the second question for you would be this one. What do you think becomes possible with psychological safety? And just go ahead and type in as much as you can. I think we have 25 characters window. So think about what you know so far and go ahead and type it in. And if you don't know, that's why you're here. We're going to learn about it. Right, and you know, I love what they're saying: the high performance culture, innovation and effectiveness, honest and open teams, transparency, self confidence. Yeah, accept failure and learn. That's wonderful. Support, appreciation, honesty and openness. Inclusive leaders, trust. Yeah. 
pick up culture. I like that. Yeah, yeah, because it's hard to innovate. It's hard to uh, discover something new uh, or experiment when you are afraid to speak up. So psychological safety is something that helps us get to the state where we're not scared to share our opinions and not uh, afraid to be different, right? Because difference is, is something that helps us um, innovate and helps us get better results. Yeah, innovation, better results. Thank you. That's awesome. So you already know something about psychological safety and you're going to learn more with this session. So specifically what we're going to cover today is the impact of psychological safety on organization, what it makes um, possible. We're going to talk about how our brain operates in the presence of fear, which is that we don't have psychological safety. And we're going to recognize some of the symptoms of fear and um, learn how to spot them in organization. We're going to uh, experiment with um, one of the ways of one of the retrospective games that you can play with your teams. And we're even going to play with a little liberating structure that is useful in um, beginning conversation around fears. A little bit about me. My name is Dana Puraiva. I'm an agile coach from New York, and I've been in the industry for the past 20 years in different areas of organization, different areas of um, you know, IT, starting from being a developer, then um, spending a lot of time on the operation side. So I've seen fear. <laughs> I've instilled fear because you know I've been a DBA manager, and it's a tough job that you know you have to have a lot of. Uh, you know, the situation to solve. And then as I moved um, more towards being um, Scrum Master and Agile Coach, I had to unlearn a lot of uh, ways of working. And I had to learn how to be, um, how to move away from instilling fear to actually creating a culture where fear is not present. Instead, psychological safety is uh, there and uh, we are able to be more innovative because the culture is different. And um, so um, what I'm doing right now, I'm an independent consultant. I work with organizations around the world, write books, speak at conferences, and it is my pleasure to be here at the Agile or India 2020 and share what I know with you in this session. One of the books that inspired me to create this uh, workshop is a book by Amy Adamson called Heroes Organization. And Emmy Edmondson um, is the one who coined the term psychological safety. So she actually discovered it um, in her uh, research uh, when she was working with the medical teams. She discovered that uh, teams that um, are successful, in fact, have more mistakes than the teams that are not successful. And that finding really puzzled her. And what she discovered through that is that it's not like the successful teams make more mistakes is that they are open to talk about them more frequently. Whereas teams that are, are less high performing, they're hiding mistakes. And so that's what helped her discover that um, psychological safety is the one that makes a difference. And in her definition, psychological safety exists when people feel their workspace in, is an environment where they can speak up, offer idea, ask questions without the fear of being punished or um, fear of being reprimanded. What's interesting, she discovered that in 1999. In 2012, um, Project Aristotle was something that Google started to um, discover what makes a team successful, what, team, what makes a team high performing team. And they discovered that there were uh, five um, different uh, criteria that um, help the team to be successful. Impact, meaning, structure, and clarity. But the, the one that was the most important was psychological safety. So again and again, psychological safety comes back uh, to be an important factor. And uh, seven years later, I'm sure many of you have seen this book, Unicorn Project, a new book that came out recently by Jen Kim, where uh, again, psychological safety was highlighted as the fourth ideal of for um, successful organization. And again, it's about being able to solve problem um, in a situation where um, it's a situation of honesty and transparency and trust. And honesty requires the absence of fear. And this is where um, 
to come into this workshop because this workshop is going to be about spotting the fear, being able to talk about fear without being um, held back and um, starting that conversation to help identify what's holding this in that and being able to work around it and solve it. So why fear? And why are we talking about it in the context of organizations? Because guess what? When we come to work, um, our work version ourselves and our um, you know, home version of ourselves is governed by the same thing, our brain. Uh, hi, Dana. Sorry. Uh, can you please turn your camera on? Because it doesn't seem it's visible. Can you just, sorry to interrupt you. But, um, that's okay. Is it on? It should be on. So right now, are you seeing all uh, my screen? So we can, so yeah, we can see your presentation, but we can't see your video thumbnail, you know, on the top or bottom. So that's interesting. It is. Okay, if, if you think it's on, then fine. Let's let's uh, let's not worry about it for now. So let's continue. Yeah, okay. If something happened on my side. Oh, okay, yeah, we can see it now. We can see it now. It's visible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, I just make sure that I don't block the picture of the brain. <laughs> okay, so um, the work version of ourselves and the home version of ourselves is governed by the same brain. So when we come to work, we are responding um, in the same way uh, to some of the situation that we face at work. And obviously our brain is very complex. This is what you're seeing right now is a very simplified version of it. And so we have areas of our brain that are responsible for um, creative thinking, for problem solving, for creating new memories, um, for motivation, focus. And then there is one area of our brain that is um, responsible for keeping us safe. And what's interesting is that um, we receive sensory stimuli uh, through two different channels. One channel goes towards the amygdala or the, the primitive brain, and the other channel goes to the rest of the brain. And so what happens in the situation of danger, which is um, could be physical danger or could be psychological danger. So anything that um, we perceive as um, potentially unsafe, physically or psychologically. Amygdala takes over. And so the, it responds to the sensory stimuli a few milliseconds faster than the rest of our brain. And then what we experience is something that's called amygdala hijack. Basically, that part of our brain takes over and it screams, danger, danger. So we're not going to get uh, any uh, sensory input to the rest of our brain. Because as far as amygdala is concerned, we have to survive. We have to respond with fight, flight, or freeze. So those are the only three responses that we're capable of in the situation of danger. And so, as you would imagine, if the um, workplace is stressful and um, amygdala is responding with that three type of response, then you're not able to think, you're not able to um, be innovative because you're experiencing that amygdala hijack um, situation. And it's hard to expect innovation from people affected by that effect because they're just not able to access that part of the brain. And that's what's making it um, difficult to be competitive or innovative for those organizations that most of the workforce is affected by this um, state. And so um, it's interesting that fight, flight, or freeze response shows up and work in a different way. So uh, just like um, you might have heard the expression brilliant jerks, which means people who are... Um, not responding in a way um, that is conducive to collaboration. So imagine um, developers, and I'm just taking them as an example. So imagine people who are very innovative and very um, brilliant, but it's very hard to work with them because they act in a way that it's defensive. It's the fight response that they're showing off. And so that's the type of um, fear response that's showing up at work. The other type of fear response is disengagement or the freeze response. And disengagement um, is something that affects a lot of workforces. And um, based on the research from um, Gallup, which is the, um, one of the research institutes, um, that in 2017, um, about
about 70% of U.S. workers were not engaged at work. And it's pretty scary because if they're not engaged, they're not innovating. And we're not able to be competitive as an organization. Another type of response that is a fear response is the flight response. When best people are leaving the organization because they don't get enough um, opportunities to innovate, they're disengaged and not interested in, in what's happening in the organization, they're looking for a better place to work. And so that's your uh, flight response. And just like uh, fear um, stops the flow of uh, sensory stimuli in our brain, the same happens at the organizational level. So this diagram is something I created based on Ron Westrom's study of organizational culture. And Ron Westrom uh, uh, defines three types of organizational culture. So one is uh, something that's called pathological culture. That's the culture affected by fear. This is where if something doesn't go right, then the natural response of the system is to suppress the bad news. It's like shoot the messenger, that's the response. And unfortunately, in those organizations, if something goes wrong, then no one learns from it. It's the natural response is to hide that information, shoot the messenger, and no learning occurs. The other type of organizational mm -hmm. culture is bureaucratic. This is where um, if something happens that's not the right thing, then um, it's going to be fixed, but we have this tendency of doing the public relations, which is um, minimizing the impact um, of that uh, problem, doing the local fix, and uh, trying to prevent that from um, being shared with others, because we're trying to keep the face. So we're trying to show that my part of the organization is not having any issues. So even if the problem is fixed, again, as an organization, we're not learning. And the last um, type of organizational culture that's called generative culture. So this is where if a problem occurs, we are looking at what was in the system that caused that situation to happen. And the assumption is that there are no bad people, there are bad systems. So let's find the problem in the system that caused us uh, to act in the way they did. And so we run blameless postmortems, um, which is a type of retrospective when we're looking for a specific root cause of a problem rather than um, who did it. And we also share the information with the rest of the organization. So not only we learn as the um, department or team where the problem happened, but also others can learn from it. And so we don't repeat the same mistakes over and over again. So generative culture is where learning is possible. This is where uh, we can experiment. This is where we can learn from our mistakes and failures. And this is where um, when we introduce Agile, DevOps, or any other new things, the response is going to be more favorable. Whereas if you introduce new initiatives, new experiments, and other type of cultures, you may generate even more fears as a response. And you're listening to me right now and thinking, oh, Dana, this is like some U.S. organization that they have in this, which is fine. We have never seen fear in our workplaces. So I'm going to offer you a little experiment. I'm going to show you a few symptoms of fear and see if you can recognize um, the response from your own experience. Risk avoidance. Typical symptoms of fear is when we are going with the safest solution and we are trying to not rock the boat. Another one is something that's called success theater. So think about a situation where um, things are not going so well, but we're reporting up the chain that project status is green. So it's green on the outside, but it's red on the inside. People also call it watermelon status. So we know it's not going well, but for the managers, we report that everything is green. The other symptoms of fear, conflict avoidance. So similar to risk avoidance, except now we're trying to go with everybody else's opinion and not share our own if it's different from the rest of the team because we're trying to avoid conflict. And again, this is one of the symptoms of fear. Another one, gossips and rumors. When um, it's not safe to talk about things publicly, um, the management is not sharing information, um, something is happening in the organization, we don't know what it is, and so a lot of 
gossip syndrome or that's how the news spreads. So again, typical symptom for fear and organization. And the last one is blaming and finger pointing. Again, when something is not going well, we're trying to find who is the person responsible for the problem rather than trying to solve the root cause of the issue. So here is the five um, you know, samples. And what I'd like you to do is um, in the chat, just go ahead and think about um, different organizations you've been part of through your career and go ahead and type in the number. Anywhere from zero, meaning Dana, you're totally crazy. I haven't seen anything like that in my work life. To five, where you experienced um, all five of this uh, through your work career at some point. Just go ahead and in this class, give me the number. Anywhere from zero to five. So again, the question is... If you've seen any of these symptoms of fear in your organizations through your work career, then give me a number anywhere from one to five. And zero, if they and I haven't seen anything like that before, you're totally crazy, go away. <laughs> so I'm seeing two, three, three. Then if you're yep, it happens a lot. Yeah. And what's interesting is that um, every time I run this, um, people recognize anywhere from, yes, some of the same five. So anywhere from two to five, that's the typical um, response um, to this inquiry because we've all been there. We've all seen this. And um, which means that we're not alone and we can find a way to deal with this um, together. So I'm going to share a couple of things that you can do. <laughs> and basically, since we're all in the same boat, so to speak, we have a choice. We can stay with the pathological culture and experience more fear, or we can look for ways to bring more generative culture and um, help to instill more learning. Because that's what generative culture helps with. It helps to be safe to experiment, open to try new things, and know that oh, you're not going to be reprimanded for failing because you are trying. Because you can't learn something new if you're not trying. And you can't try without failing. So you will fail at some point, And that's okay in the generative culture organization. That's what we want to have more of. So with that, I'm going to share a couple of things that um, I created in uh, my experience. And uh, this is one thing that um, helped me to work through the um, fear situation in one of the dangers I was in. So I created this game called Fear in the Workplace, which uh, pretty much had all the different types of fears that I experienced myself. I've seen others experiencing around me and um, using it as a game in retrospective helped us have an open conversation around um, what's happening in the organization. And um, here, like every monster is some kind of fear um, that you know, is um, typical in organization and a fear or symptom of fear. And the way how we run it, we pretty much gave everyone a deck of these little monsters and asked people to pick which ones they observed happening in their team. And they did it anonymously. So there was a facilitator who collected all the responses face down. And then what you're seeing here, this is where facilitator just, you know, looking at the responses, and put out um, this collection of monsters uh, showing what's happening in the team. And so when you look at uh, seven people responding with all these different responses and seeing that, um, for example, uh, depletion, of, depletion of emotional energy was the strongest one, we knew which one we need to start conversation from. So that was the one way to um, start looking into this. And um, I created um, the next version of the game, which I'm going to um, send a link to everyone um, to sample if you want to play with your teams. And what was interesting that um, when people played the game, this is one of the things that they shared, is that playing the game helps you put the fear in front of us rather than between us. And so now we are able to have an open conversation, be able to... Um, 
fight it together, be able to uh, detach from our you know, feelings and look at the situation uh, from a system perspective, perspective, look at it from outside in and have a conversation about how to solve the problem. So what do you do if you don't have this game, but you can still have a conversation around fear? So this is where I'm going to run a little experiment with you. We're not going to share it with each other right now. We don't have um, the fair breakouts, but I'm going to walk you through how to do it so you can do it with your teams and uh, you can see how it's useful in starting the conversation around fears. So for that, you will need a piece of paper and a pen. And what you're going to do, you're going to start a little drawing session. So I'm going to give you a second to grab a pen and paper. And what you're going to do on the pen and paper, you're first going to start making a list of things that worry you the most in your workplace. I'm going to give you one minute. And you're not sharing this, so this is just for you personally. Just start writing these things on a piece of paper. And once you're done, circle the four scariest, most alarming things. So I'm going to give you a minute to start writing those things down. Again, these are things that worry you the most in your workplace. You may not call them fears. There might be things that you worry about, but just go ahead and write them down in your list. Okay, looks like my timer was stopped <laughs> for some reason. So I'm going to go ahead and um, move on. So hopefully you got a few um, you know, things that worry you the most. And out of those things, if you circle the four scariest, most alarming things, you're going to work with those four things in the next step. And for the next step, you're going to uh, flip the page to the other side. And you're going to... There's an interesting question coming out in discussion. I'll get to this once we um, go through the exercise. And for the, the other side of your page, you're going to start making this little grid. And in the top left corner, you're going to draw one of the shapes. So one shape is going to be a circle. And it can be any, it doesn't have to be a perfect circle, it can be oval, just however you can make a circle. In the next grid, you're going to make a square and then next shape is going to be a spiky shape, just any kind of you know, spiky uh, shape that has different angles, different edges. And the last one is going to be this squiggly line. And if you haven't seen a squiggly line, it's going to look something like this. It doesn't have to be exactly like this, but this, these are uh, going, these shapes are going to be the bodies of your monsters. Because what you're drawing right now, you're drawing all tiny monsters. So now go ahead, add fins, ears, eyes, and make those monsters scary. And I'm going to give you a few seconds.
And now you're going to take those four things that you circled, your four scariest, uh, most alarming things that you wrote in your list, and you're going to map them to these monsters. Just whatever you um, added, whichever scary monsters you did, map, map those four worries to your monsters. And so when we do this exercise with the teams, you start with you know, your uh, individual writing the lists and drawing the monsters and then um, you know, mapping the monsters to um, those specific worries that you listed. And then what we do next is what makes a difference. Because next we are going to do the monster walk. Obviously, we're not going to do it today with everyone in this session, but when you're running it with your teams, this is what you can do. And I'm going to show you. So yeah, we walk around showing the monsters and asking them for advice, asking other people for advice how to tackle your monster. So this is how it looks like when we do it with the co-located team. When we face-to-face, pre-COVID, this is you know what we do. We walk around showing the monsters. And what you find is that a lot of times the same worries that you have, others have it in the team as well. And so it helps you build empathy. It helps you build connection between people and the team. It also helps you figure out how to deal with those monsters. Because guess what? When you're making those drawings, suddenly they become funny. And then when you can laugh about things that are um, your worries, it's becoming a little bit less scary. And so that's one of the ways how you can start having conversation around what is um, happening in the team, what are some of the worries that people have, how can you address them together. So how can you do it in the virtual space? If you have a way to put people in breakouts in pairs, this is what you would do. You would send them into breakouts for uh, four minutes um, for each pair, so two people, two minutes per person, and then do the same thing. We're going to introduce the monsters, ask for advice. It's that one-on-one -one conversation that makes a difference. And then obviously you can come back into the bigger room and then share all that information. But putting people in pair conversation makes it possible to do the monster walk in the virtual space. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Let's see, I think I'll take a few. So yeah, there was uh, a question, who's responsible for psychological safety? It's entire team responsibility. And you know, what we're going to learn in the rest of this um, presentation is that there are many ways um, you can approach building psychological safety. There are certain things that you can do as an individual, there are things you can do as a team, and um, definitely you can do a lot as a leader. Because um, if you can build a happy bubble at the team level, but the entire organization is not a safe place, then you can just go so far. Definitely leaders have the most impact on uh, whether the entire organization is uh, a psychologically safe organization. And um, to that um if you can um, have a um, book that I was referencing in the beginning um, by Amy Admonson, that book has tons of uh, information about what are some of the practices that are effective at the leadership level for building psychological space in the organization. And that brings us to the second part of this um, workshop, which is talking about safety in the work workplace toolkit. So that's another game that I created um, that has um, different practices that are uh, coming either from my own experience working with teams or from the book by Amy Edmondson, uh, specifically the leadership practices. Most of them are coming from that book. So what the game makes, makes possible is that now you have a collection of things and you can quickly flip through them and you can play a game where you can identify the problems or specific fear to deal with and then search to the collection of uh, possible um, tools and practices that can help you fight that fear. And um, interesting model that I like to use um, in relationship to those uh, safety practices, something that's called SCARF model. The SCARF model was created by David Rock, um, who is um, one of the founders of um, Neuro Leadership Institute. And um, he defined, uh, the SCARF is the acronym. And so it brings together a specific social domains that activate the same threat or reward response in our brain 
that we rely for physical survival. And SCARF stands for um, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. So anytime that these domains are affected in a negative way, we feel threatened. Anytime that these uh, domains are affected in a positive way, we feel rewarded. And so the practices that um, are included in my game, they are um, adding positive um, experience to all these um, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. So I'm going to walk you through very quickly because uh, it's a very short session. And as I mentioned, I'm going to um, share a link uh, to a sample step of uh, both of your in workplace and safety in workplace. So you can experiment with those with your team and see um, what are some of the practices that you can bring in. So some of the um, practices that are helpful in uh, generating the positive response in terms of status. And you'll notice that uh, many of them are leadership um, level um, practices. Um, one of the um, interesting approach is manage by not knowing. Ask questions. Don't assume that as a leader, you know everything. So ask questions um, to people who report to you because um, that will um, show them that you actually value their opinion. And as a result, the feeling of status um, is going to be more positive. Um, asking for help, that's another thing that you can do even within your own team. Uh, share concerns for course hierarchy. So these are the different things that you can do uh, to um, help people feel that their opinion is valuable, that their status in the team, the status in the organization is respectful and uh, respectable. And so they will feel positive um, as they're interacting with um, others in the organization. Um, the other domain is something that's called certainty. And this is where you can uh, make sure that people know that um, when they are experimenting and they're making mistakes, that's not something that's going to be um, looked at um, as negative. And so one of the practices that leaders, leaders can bring is uncoupling fear from failure. So we will fail if we try. If we don't try and we don't fail, we don't make mistakes, it means that we're not going to come up with anything innovative. So um, introducing different practices and building a culture where fear uh, and failure are decoupled when um, something fails, we even celebrate it. We host uh, failure parties, and you know, this is fail, learn, move on, one of the things that you know, people can embrace and uh, make sure that there is that experimental mindset that we're building as an organization. So increasing certainty, meaning that knowing that it's not the end of the world if you fail, as, as, as long as you learn from it. Um, the other uh, domain that you know, can be positively impacted by these practices is autonomy. And this is where um, we all heard about autonomy, master, and purpose. And then you'll think um, that this is one of the things that motivate individuals to be the best version of themselves and to be interested in what they're doing. And again, uh, building um, ways to tap into people's uh, ideas or uh, bringing in different uh, voices, different perspectives in the conversation, or uh, discovering uh, those ideas and as leaders amplifying those ideas, this is something that's going to increase autonomy. And one of the uh, practices that's very useful uh, in that space is something that's called liberating structures. So I encourage you to uh, check out this website. It has a collection of 33 practices, which are different facilitation techniques designed for engaging everyone in the conversation and bringing in different voices. So it's always about not just one person speaking, like <laughs> what I'm doing today, but you know, having um, an opportunity for everyone in the room to participate in problem solving and discovery um, and, and finding solutions together. Another domain that's um, going to help with increasing psychological safety is relatedness. And this is where there is a lot we can do at the team level. Introducing team norms, introducing core protocols, um, creating ways for uh, team members to connect as people. And one of the practices that you know, I'm um, very um, in favor of something that's called 
user manual. So everyone in the team is asked to create their own user manual, which means what's the best way to operate with me? So how, where are my red buttons, which you shouldn't press when you need to work with me? And what are some of the ways I'm looking to bring impact to this team? And so each individual in the team creates something like that, and then they share. So that way they know, get to know about each other, they get to know how to work better together. And using that, they build um, team norms and um, they use those in frequent retrospectives. So again, all these practices that help build own relatedness, which in, uh, in turn helps with uh, creating psychological safety. And yeah, these are some of the examples of um, team simple norms, which could be written in team language and the team language could be very different from team to team, as you can see here. And the good part is that um, it's not something that's enforced on the team. It's something that team generates um, by themselves and it's definitely a bottom-up type of approach. And the last part of SCARF is fairness. This is where, um, again, embracing sustainable pace, on um, creating team norms, measuring team health and safety. So making sure that not only we created the team norms once, but we also go back and see, are we still um, living by those norms? Um, do we get what we need to get from this team for ourselves as um, the professionals and individuals? And so measuring team helps, we can add different aspects of teamwork and uh, even measuring psychological safety is something that will help in that area. Okay. And as I mentioned, peer focus retrospective is something that you can do. And um, studying this, identifying what is the problem, um, that voting on which fear to talk about first, looking for different psychological safety tools to help you address um, that specific fear, and then just going through typical lean coffee conversation and discussing how to address the fear that we have in, in your uh, specific situation. And if you'd like to try it with your teams, um, take a screenshot of this, um, this link um, to a free sample version of both uh, the Fearing Workplace and the Psychological Safety Game, so you can experiment and see how you can start conversation about fears and how you can change the conversation from being it about fear to being about how can we make things better in our team, how can we build a um, psychological safety um, in our team and expand it to our organization. So with that, I think that's all I had to share. I'd love to hear from you uh, through the chat. What surprised you the most in this session? So go ahead and type in in uh, discuss. What surprised you the most in this session? You have the monster game, yeah? And I encourage you to try the monster game with your teams because it's a fun way to start this in a very serious conversation because we've all been there, we've all experienced that you know, state when it's not safe at all. And this is a way to start learning that, hey, we can actually share some of the challenges that we have and we can you know, put them out in the open, and that's the first step towards solving them. Ah, uh, I really my response in the question to Q&A. So, uh, I responded to the question of uh, psychological safety, of who is responsible for that. Was there another question? What was the other question? That's the only question I'm seeing. Can you, um, Devon, can you retype re your, um, okay, got it, got it. So finger pointing, gossips and rumors are um, 
great danger to the environment. How do you deal with this, uh, that as they generally out of your control? So yes and no. You can start with addressing these uh, at the team level, right? Because um, this is something that um, this is where you have control at the team level. And this is where you can um, bring this as part of conversation in your team norms during the retrospective. So making sure that people understand that this is not the type of culture they want to build. Of course, if it's a leadership level uh, problem, then you're getting, getting finger pointed from the top down, then this is a little bit outside of your control. And this is where Amy Edmondson book, buy it, sneak it in, <laughs> give it as a gift to your leaders. Hopefully that will inspire them a little bit. Uh, but definitely changing the culture and the organization, it's not easy, but starting it from the team itself and you know, changing the culture at that level would be a very good step. Okay. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us uh, today. I know it's the end of the day for you, so I appreciate you sticking through this session. And you know, hopefully, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Vadiana, for doing this wonderful session. I think we all learned a lot and enjoyed it. So, as you can see from the storm of likes, uh, thumbs ups that you're getting.